If you're a first time guest with us, I would love to invite you to uh, take out that Connect card that you were handed on the way in. If you're in the house, that printed Connect card, go ahead and take it out and begin to fill it out. If you'd rather fill out a digital copy of the Connect card, scan the seat back in front of you, and you can complete that online. If you're online with us, there's a link dropped in the comment section. I'd encourage you to just take a moment and let us know who you are, how we can connect with you. One of the most important things on that Connect card for us is an area for prayer. We want to come alongside of you, and we want to pray for you, with you. And unless you tell us how, uh, we don't know how to pray for you, but we consider it an honor and a privilege and a joy to pray for you. We are in part two of stories of faith, part two of stories of faith, and I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter eight, Matthew chapter eight, Matthew chapter eight. We're going to begin in verse 14 today, Matthew chapter eight, beginning in verse 14. Uh, the main idea that we're going to press in today, I would encourage you to write this down and consider. The main idea is that Jesus must come first. Out of all the priorities in life, out of all the pursuits in life, out of all the things and people that are trying to capture our attention, where does Jesus fall? Where does Jesus line up in your own life? And it would be my prayer that all of us would leave this worship gathering with Jesus being the number one priority in each of our lives. Uh, only you can make that decision, though. Only I can make that decision for me. But I would, I, I, it would be my prayer and my hope that by the end of all of this, we would see Jesus for who he is, high and lifted up, amen? the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we would see him that holds all authority and all power and we would submit to him and nothing and no one else. Jesus must come first. Verse 14, Jesus went into Peter's house, saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her then she got up and began to serve him. Jesus is in Capernaum. We learned about that last week. Verse 5, when he entered Capernaum. Verse 1, we read that Jesus came off the mountainside. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 7. We've spent many a weeks looking at the blessed life and the best sermon ever for Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. Jesus is sitting in his place authority on the mountainside and he's instructing the disciples and the crowd has gathered around him to listen. It's Matthew chapter five. That's Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter eight starts with Jesus coming down the mountainside. He's coming down the mountainside. In April, I uh, walked the Holy Land and uh, I took this picture. I uh, took this picture from the the, the area that we uh, have begun to take teams, it, this isn't, by the way, part of the uh, most tours don't go. This is like the off-road version. Uh, so if, if you come to Israel with me, you're going to see some things that typically most people don't see. Uh, and if you're interested, by the way, in going in 2025, January, Audra and I will be leading a team. Love for you to come with us as we walk the, the Holy Land. But this picture I took from the side of the Sermon on the Mount area. Now, do we know exactly where Jesus sat in authority and began to teach? No. Uh, but this place, there's something about this place with an acoustical feel that many would have gathered and could hear his words that day. But this picture is overlooking the Sea of Galilee. We see the Sea of Galilee. And so Matthew chapter 8, Jesus walks down the mountainside and he walks into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was the epicenter of Jesus's earthly ministry. Two-thirds of Jesus's earthly ministry centered around the Sea of Galilee, most of which was right here in Capernaum. Uh, this is what you will be greeted with if you go today. It's certainly not ancient. <laughs> uh, uh, 
It's just nice. And so we, uh, you walk through and you see the ancient ruins of Capernaum from Jesus's day. And you see the synagogue uh, where Jesus would have taught from and where Jesus would have ministered out of. Go to the next, the synagogue. And, and you can see these, these ancient ruins that were found and excavated. It's a wonderful sight. You see this view. And then I want you to see another view. If you're visual like me, you'll appreciate these pictures. And if you're not, just hold on. We'll We'll get there. And so you see, you see the ancient ruins of the synagogue. And then the next picture should show us uh, some more like display what's been found there over the years, dating all the way back to Jesus, uh, Jesus's time. Uh, and then we see outside of the synagogue, these are uh, ancient homes, ancient homes. Uh, they're not like the typical three twos, you know, a uh, little smaller, a little more condensed. Uh, but you see the, 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 the footers, if you will. Uh, and then mixed in there are some mikvahs. Uh, the Jewish people would have had to step in the mikvah, the Jewish uh, baptismal uh, uh, cleansing. Uh, they would have had to step Step into the waters of cleansing to be to, in order to step into the synagogue, and so uh, this is why the mikvahs are close to the synagogue, and so you can see see that a little bit, and so this is where chapter eight is taking place. Chapter eight is 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 unfolding before, and then Jesus, verse fourteen, went into Peter's home. Peter's mother-in-law is laying on the bed; she has a fever. We see that. He touched her. She got up to serve. The, the last picture is, shows us uh, what is described as Peter's home. Now, can I say 100% dogmatically that this is Peter's home? No, I would be a liar. Uh, however, it has been passed down from generation to generation that this was the site of Peter's home. And so, uh, like the Catholics do uh, throughout the world, they uh, have built a church over this site. And... Um, and, uh, you know, they love to accept your donations uh, as you walk into their church. And, and then you walk up and then you walk to the center and there's a glass floor. So you can look down and see this, see this from the top view. It's, it's pretty incredible. And so Peter's, Peter's home, just a little bit of visual help, some geographical help as we study the living word of God today. Jesus went into Peter's house, saw his mother-in-law lying in a bed with a fever. It's been said that this mother-in-law must have been a good woman for her son-in-law, for her son-in-law to have firstly allowed her to live with them, but, but secondly, for her son-in-law to be anxious for her to be healed. Now, I'm just going to let that, you know, just, just let it kind of sit there. All right? I'm, personally, I'm not going to go any further because the 9 a.m. my mother-in-law was on the front row. Uh, and then, uh, secondly, I live across the street. So, uh, <laughs> but you can have some good conversations at lunch today, if you will. Uh, and so what does Jesus do? He touched her hand and the fever left her. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Now we see in chapter eight, we see in, in chapter eight that there's a, the miracle of the leper being healed. And as Pastor Zach shared last week with us, he gave us a little bit of insight that those with leprosy would have been outside the city. They would have been outcast. Anywhere they walked, they would have to shout, unclean, unclean. They lived an isolated, painful, dying life. And when we consider Jesus touching and healing the leper, and then we move over here to this section of scripture and we see Jesus touching and healing a lady with a fever. What are we reminded of? Our oh, church, we're reminded that Jesus cares deeply about the bigger problems of life, but he also cares deeply about the smaller problems in life. I've never known one person to not ever have a fever, you know? It just comes on and then, praise God, it leaves us eventually. And, and so we just, we sleep. Maybe we take some kind of a shower. I don't know. Uh, we drink lots of fluid and, and the fever goes. And, but how often do we come to God with the big problems of life? You know what I'm talking about? Those big moments of life, the big decisions of life, the big needs of life. Do we, do we come to the father and we spend time, hours begging him, will you come through? Will you come through? Will you come through? And then we get sick with a fever and we're like, ah, you know, I got this. 
I'll just binge watch this, uh, you know, the latest show that's been on my list. You know what I'm saying? And so this story of faith reminds us, one, that Jesus cares about all the problems that we face. And two, it encourages us to call upon him. Jesus steps into Peter's house. And he touches Peter's mother-in-law's hand and heals her. Matthew Poole says this, the miracle here was not in the cure of an incurable disease, but in the way, but in the way of the cure by a touch of his hand, a touch of his hand. Jesus cares for smaller problems also. Uh, for many of you, you, you don't know necessarily all of what it's like what the pastor faces from week to week, but you're encouraged to pray for the leadership of this church. A little bit of insight. There's not many weeks that go by in prepping to preach the word of God that I'm not woken up in the middle of the night with the word on my heart and a word from the Lord regarding his word. And so that happened a couple nights ago. In the middle of the night, I woke up. And this is what was on my mind. What Jesus can do with just one touch would take you and I an eternity to do. I wrote it down in my notes app on my phone and I went back to sleep. <laughs> but I'm here to present to you that our Savior holds all authority, all power. And he touches this woman, touches her hand, one touch to her hand, and she's healed. She's healed. Back to verse 15. Then she got up and began to serve him. What a response. And church, I don't know if there's a more proper response to being touched by Jesus, to receiving his power, to encountering the living God. I, I can't think of a better response for the church than to get up, rise up, and begin to serve him. I don't believe that there is any other proper response. Oftentimes we, we put worship in a box. That worship is this time where we sing, such an awesome God you are. I, I was singing, I don't know all the words. Uh, but he's but, uh, uh, such a, uh, uh, you know. And, and, and like we look forward to this all day. We're, yeah, you know, coming in, coming in. Who pulled me out of that pit? And we get all in that, man. But, but then it's like, oh, we're going to open the word. And, and, and so sometimes, sometimes if we're not honest, it's like, I don't know. Is that the same word? Worship, or uh, you know, I'm here for the the music, or or then when we're called to action and to serve in these, uh, the, to serve the Lord in, in His church, or or to serve the Lord in a love week, it's like, nah, I think I'll sit back and let someone else do that. But can I tell you today? I submit to you today that worship is far more than singing songs to Him. Worship is a lifestyle that we are called to to say, "Here I am, Lord, take me." Use me for your glory and for the good of others that my life might be a life of service to the king. Service to the king. Jesus touches her hand. She's healed. She gets up and begins to serve him. If you've been touched by Jesus then you have been called to serve. If you've been touched by Jesus, you've been called to serve for 15 years now. We've shared over and over and over again that save people, serve people. Save people, write that down, save people, serve people. If you've been touched by the Lord Jesus, you've been called into his service. Don't tell me that you've been saved. 
Don't, don't, tell, don't, don't tell me that you've been set free, that you've been forgiven of all your sins, that your trajectory was once towards hell. But, but now it's to heaven. Don't, don't, don't tell me that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you and I'm just going to sit back and only receive. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, would you write that reference down? says this, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Church, listen to that. He saved us and he's called us with a holy calling. All believers, there is a calling on your life. And for the majority, it will never be to stand on this platform behind this pulpit and proclaim this word. And that's okay. That's not the calling for the majority. It's a calling for the few. But the, we are all called to partake in his service. He has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works. Praise be to God. It's not because some of y'all are really good people. It's not enough. It's not enough that you're just a good, good, good person. But according to his own purpose, do you, do you see the gospel? This is the true gospel. Not that I'm just good enough, but according to his own purpose and grace, according to his grace, his grace, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's the unmerited, his grace that he's poured out, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Listen again. If you have been saved, you have been called to serve. One of the expectations of every partner of Discovery Church is to serve faithfully. Two words, serve faithfully. The church should serve faithfully. June 30th, in two weeks, we're going to have a partnership lunch. If you've, never, if you've never joined us for a partnership lunch and you're like, I'm all in. This is the home where God has called me to. Sign up today. Go to wearediscovery.com, see Tiffany, see one of the uh, pastors or, or elders, and we'll sign you up for that lunch, that partnership lunch. And we'll take an hour, we'll eat together, and we'll look at what it means to be a partner of this local church. And one of the expectations is to serve faithfully, to not just come and sit, but God has called all of us to serve him. And the beauty of it is we all have different gifts. God has gifted each of us differently. He's given us different passions. I mean, there's some things that excite you that I'm just scratching my head like, I don't know how any that could ever excite me. But that's the beauty of our God. He knows he's over all things. Like some of y'all cook some, some incredible meals. You don't want to eat from me, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, I can grill a couple things. Borderline burnt. It's going to be well done every time, guaranteed. But, but that's not my gift. But that's some of y'all's gift. And what does it look like for the church to use the gifts that God has given each of us for the good of others and for his glory? For the good of others and the glory of God. First Peter chapter four, verse 10. Would you write this reference down? Just as each of us has received a gift, use it to serve others. So we're like, I don't know if I'm quite in. Well, you, you can't believe this and just continue to sit back, right? I mean, I guess you could, uh, the, the, but I will say the blessings upon blessings that people miss out on, that the church misses out on by not engaging in the king's service. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. God's poured out his grace upon us. He's gifted you. How are you using these gifts for his glory? Look to verse 16, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. Do you see the second story of faith before us? The second story of faith Jesus's popularity is increasing. People are coming from all over because there's nothing about Jesus. That's why they gathered. That's why they gathered on the Sermon on the Mount. And if you look at the beginning of Matthew chapter five, Jesus wasn't talking to the crowds. He was instructing the disciples. And, and that's why, I mean, he just kept coming in hot throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. He didn't, he didn't back off. He didn't go some shallow, weak message. He didn't water down the gospel. He spoke truth. 
as he instructed the disciples. Jesus increases in popularity. We see in the first story of faith today that it was with just one touch that this woman was healed. But notice the second story today, the second story of faith. What is it? One word, a word. All of these people, demon possessed people, they come to Jesus looking for freedom, looking to be set free. And what do they find in Jesus? They hear a word. And again, can I just encourage you and I today to lift up your eyes to the king? Whatever you might be walking through, does he not hold all authority and all power? Is he not the God of unlimited resources? Will you trust him? That was the challenge last week and it continues today. Are you living by faith? Will you trust him? Whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever valley you might be walking through, will you trust him that with just one touch, this woman is healed? And with just one word, multitudes are set free. He holds all authority. And Jesus and only Jesus is able to set the captives free. We see this reference in verse 17. I'm thankful that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew references this prophecy dating back over 600 years prior before Jesus walked this earth. Here is this prophecy given by Isaiah, a man of God, to speak on behalf of God to the people of God. Chapter 53 of Isaiah verse Verse four, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried our pains. And we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Do you see what the Lord has done for us? God in his sovereignty knew that there would be no other way into salvation except through the perfect spotless lamb of God. In fact, if you recall, John prepares the way. And what does he say? There he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, the only perfect one, walking this earth, dying on a cross, his blood shed. Hebrews describes it this way, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. His blood shed, his body taken off of the cross, laid in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day rising victorious. And I would pray and hope that we would never grow tired of hearing the gospel over and over again. I would pray and hope that we would never grow tired of telling ourselves each day that we wake up the gospel, reminding me of the gospel, what Jesus has accomplished for me, that which I could not accomplish for me. He accomplished it for me and for the the world, the provision of our uh, healing, both physically and spiritually was made by the sufferings of Jesus. The physical dimension of our healing is partially realized now, but our hope is not this side of heaven. Our hope is set on heaven. We are citizens of heaven. One day when we step into heaven, we take on this glorified body. And what a day, what a moment that's going to be when we see Jesus face to face. And we're no longer surrounded by pain and suffering and tears. What a day that is going to be when we meet our Savior face to face. This section of Matthew's Gospels shows four different people being healed. Don't miss this. Four different stories of faith. The first last week, a Jew. 
with no social or religious privileges. Second, a Gentile officer of the army occupying and oppressing Israel. Three, a woman related to one of Jesus' devoted followers. And then fourth, unnamed multitudes. Unnamed multitudes. And from all of this, we understand that physical healing is an area where God especially shows his sovereignty. Have any of you been touched by the Lord recently? He's healed you. It's by his sovereignty. And there's some that are waiting his healing. And can I tell you, he does things as he pleases, not as you and I might expect. A.W. Pink wrote many years ago, God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, and always as he pleases. None can thwart him. None can hinder him quickly. Look to verse 18. When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. Again, his famous spread. People are coming from all, all around to just get a touch, to see, to just get close. And he gave the order to go to the other side. Now you have to come back next week to understand what the other side, what he means by the other side. Hope you'll, hope you'll do that. A scribe approached him and said, teacher, I will follow you whether you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and birds of sky have nests. The son of man has no place to lay his head. Second, Lord, another of his disciples said, first, let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. At, at, the, at the close of this section of scripture, there's two people. Two, two men encounter Jesus. And, and what is this section describing? This section describes a, a cost to following him. There is a cost to following him. What is Jesus trying to describe? He's trying to describe to the scribe who was a religious leader of the day and to a disciple that had been walking with him, listening to him, witnessing him, his miracles. He describes that there's no glamour in following me. If you want the stage or the limelight or the pedestal, then don't follow me. He said there's a cost. He's teaching those that are listening that day, he's teaching there's a cost to following him. There's always a cost to following him. If we are going to put Jesus first, then we must count the cost of following him. Notice uh, Jesus didn't tell the man, no, you can't follow me. Do you see that? You, you don't see it. <laughs> it's not there. Jesus describes the reality of following me. It's like to describe, hey, man, if you think I got a palace out back here or something, you know, like this king size bed, a California king bed, and nothing against that, by the way, if you, if you got one. Okay. Yeah, um, but but, but, but if, if you think it's all of this, you're sadly mistaken because I don't even know where I'm going to lay my head tonight. And what a word, what an encouragement for us as we consider following Jesus, counting the cost to follow him. He looks back to foxes, remarks on birds of the sky, how God provides for them. And church, you need to be encouraged and reminded today that the God we serve provides for us. And again, often not how we think he should or even as we demand him to, but he comes through. He has proven himself faithful, not that he has to, but he has proven himself faithful to Audra and I time and time again. Perhaps you need to remember the last time that God came through for you to be encouraged to keep walking, to keep taking that next step of faith, to keep believing, to keep trusting him. Following Jesus will cost you everything. D.A. Carson said, if the, if the scribe was too quick in promising, this disciple, this disciple was too slow in performing. So what does Jesus do at the close of this? Jesus pressed the man to follow him now and clearly stated the principle 
that family obligations or any obligation must not be put ahead of following Jesus. Jesus must come first. Listen to the words of Charles Spurgeon. Much of the concerns of politics, party tactics, committee meetings, social reforms, innocent amusements, and so forth may be very fitly described as burying the dead. Much of this is very needful, proper, and commendable work. But still only such a form of business as unregenerate men can do as well as disciples of Jesus. This is what he says. Listen, let them do it. But if we are called to preach the gospel, let us give ourselves wholly to our sacred calling. Jesus calls every follower of Jesus to live with unconditional trust and undivided affection for him for Jesus must come first the interaction with these two men is is humbling in fact he uses the phrase of, uh, a phrase of humility the son of man did you see that you'll see this throughout the gospels 81 this, this phrase is used, son of man. Jesus is referencing his humility and the glory. Both humility and the glory. It almost seems like Jesus, though, at, at the close, is trying to talk these two men out of following him. They're eager to say, hey, we'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus looks back at both of them, challenges them to count the cost before following Last week, Pastor Zach kicked off this teaching series. And, and I remember around age 15, he approached me. And he said, I feel God calling me into ministry. And I don't know my exact words, but, but they were something to the effect of, I disagree. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you have heard from the Lord. And so... The, the next couple of years, we spent much time together. And it was, it was my goal that at the end, that he would realize the weight of ministry, that it's not what it appears to be. That this is the smallest percentage of what God has called me to do. But I'm humbled and grateful. I'm humbled and grateful to serve as one of the pastors of this church. And you might be thinking, why would I take time to try and call someone out of the ministry? It wasn't necessarily that I was trying to call him out of the ministry, but I wanted him to count the cost to truly following Jesus. And it's the same for you and I today. To count the cost of following Jesus. Will you count the cost of following Jesus? Because again, as we gather here, I don't know about you, but, but I'm encouraged. Some of you might be thinking, well, you got to be here. And although you may be, uh, you know, right, I, I would gladly be here because there's something about looking into different faces and how the Lord uses me to encourage you and you to encourage me. There's something about the community of the church as we're living on mission for the Lord Jesus. There's something about spurring each other on. I don't know where Jesus falls in priorities for you today. Man, but as we close, I want, I want you to pause, and take a step back and just consider. What has the number one place in your life today? There's not one that's that's not walking through some kind of frustration or has just exited a frustration or about to walk into a frustration. Uh, that's the broken world we live in. And, and so the encouragement is as we find ourselves in the midst of challenges, it's easy for before the challenge for Jesus to be number one, Jesus, I'll give you everything. I'll follow you all the days of my life when things are easy, but it's when things really get tough. As we close today, I would encourage you, challenge you. 
Jesus must come first. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this place? If you're online, would you do the same? The, the reason that we ask you to do this every week is to limit distractions, to get along with God, to limit distractions. Just for a moment, would you consider what place does he have? What place does he have in your life? Is he number one? If he's not, what has taken his place? That, that means there's, there's other things or things that become idols. Jesus must come first. And so would you get along with him today just for a moment? Would you say, Jesus, you're number one. Jesus, you're number one. You're number one. Help me to replace all these things in my life that, that have taken your place. And help, help me, God, strengthen me. Give me the courage. That you would be the number one. As people are praying all across this place, I wonder if there's someone here today that's never surrendered over to him for salvation and today would be the day of salvation for you. Would you confess that Jesus is Lord, that there's no other way into salvation but through him? Would you, would you confess, admit that you're a sinner and that Jesus is the savior? He's a wonderful savior. Would you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that he is alive today? Would you trust him with your life? Would you trust him with your life?